Now, as much as you guys are going to hate me for it, um, I, I do want to bring up in this video, I want to take a journey into the deepest recesses of materialistic pop culture. Now, now the advent of the internet, frankly, has changed language forever. Before the internet, uh, the likelihood that the letters LOL would become synonymous with laughter was, was probably very slim. An entirely new lexicology has arisen, giving completely new meanings to words like troll. Our language has become much more abbreviated and acronym friendly, and in many ways, with the preponderance of the use of emoji, for example, our language has learned to rely a bit less on alphanumerical communication and more on pictographic communication. And I'm certainly not the expert on this. Maybe I'm completely wrong about this. Talk to Stardust. He really knows about that stuff. Uh, but, you know, instead of saying that we are feeling sad or happy, we now have, you know, these little critters at our disposal. And frankly, I'm all for it. I'm all for having as many ways as possible to communicate our thoughts available to us. The limitation of language is what you would call uh, double plus ungood. It results in less avenues for self-expression and transmission of thought to our fellow human being. Uh, given this, I welcome emoticons and all of their derivatives into the toolbox of human language. So, gentlemen, consider the following article titled, Should Grown Men Use Emoji? And it states the following, A specter is haunting our communications. The specter of emoji. Right now, it's likely that someone you know is texting a thumbs up image to confirm a meeting or maybe sending off a friendly ghost emoji to say boo to a friend. Yet the little guys and gals and farm animals and foodstuffs aren't without controversy. Word-centric fuddy-duddies see the decline of literacy reflected in their heart-shaped eyes, while guardians of decorum lament the spread of greasy kid stuff dripping from the characters' snail trails. Given their resemblance to the stickers that adorn the notebooks of schoolgirls, not to mention their widespread adoption as the lingua franca of tweens and teens everywhere, some people wonder whether grown men should be using them at all. Now that's interesting. Already, we're being told that a simple tool for language that doesn't have any kind of connotation isn't masculine enough. We're told that emojis are similar to, quote, stickers that adorn the notebooks of schoolgirls. And, and so our language may have changed, but it seems that in terms of our desire to preemptively decide what masculinity is, in hopes of limiting the way men can express themselves, we appear to still be stuck in the Stone Age. Of course, no man is going to want to use these uh, emojis if the cultural narrative succeeds in giving them an inherently feminine connotation. And it is that mechanism that has been controlling men since civilization started and well before. And the article continues and says, Other experts, that is, emoji users themselves, are less definitive. It's a fine line, said Melissa Karen, a Chicago-based accounts manager for Kenshu, a software company. Emojiing is a dance. She noted that some men use emoji in ways she finds inscrutable, particularly in the context of romance, when they are giving to texting the symbol of the winky face with the tongue sticking out. I don't know what it means, Miss Carlin said. She offered a piece of advice for our potential suitors. Use your words. I'm a big fan of using your words. In a discussion that appeared last year on Yahoo Answers, one anonymous poster said of emoji, Quote, they're fun, but I just find them emasculating. In a spirited thread on the same topic over on Reddit, another emoji user counseled, like anything else, moderation is key. Now, in fairness to the article, there were some instances of men thinking that uh, the use of emoji and emoticons were exactly what they are. That is just a trivial, non-gender specific way to convey thoughts. And it says, quote, Jordan Peele of the sketch comedy duo Key and Peele proved his fluency when he retold the story of The Shining through 96 carefully selected emoji packed into a single tweet, an effort that has won him more than 13,000 retweets. Certain men embrace emoji while holding them at a remove. Gil Schwartz, a CBS executive who writes under the name Stanley Bing, called himself a rare user of ironic emojis. He said he is partial to the pig and the horse. I use them because I think they're stupid. He said at some point, texting is kind of stupid. He has no fear that using them may somehow put a dent in his masculinity. Quote, for a moment, you're Taylor Swift, said Mr. Shorts, who was 63. If you're confident in your manhood, you can certainly lapse into Taylor Swifthood momentarily. And I, I just find that last bit very interesting. Taylor Swifthood. 
right? That's the pejorative used for men that express themselves a little too readily with these emoticons. And, what, and it would indicate that when men do this, they are perceived as being vapid or self-centered and devoid of self-control. And therein lies the rub, folks. It is okay for women and women only to do this. They are perceived already as being vapid, self-centered, and devoid of self-control. It is okay for women and women only to do this because our society allows them to be vapid, perpetual adolescents with very little self-control. And that last bit, I think, is a tacit admission of this. Now, of course, uh, some people are going to uh, imply that it's pedantic of me to, to bring this up. You know, that maybe I'm looking for issues that aren't there or that aren't important. And frankly, maybe they're right. I, I don't really know. But I believe that while these specific observations are on the surface uh, very trivial, they also manage to work their way up to the serious matters that affect men in the same fashion. Take, for instance, this article that I found uh, titled, Society Needs to Allow Men the Right to Cry. And it begins with the following. It says, quote, on Monday, just as the Tim Hunt, and this was a scientist, I think, the Nobel uh, laureate or Nobel Prize winner uh, scientist that said, uh, you know, women get in the way of science by crying too much and all of that. Uh, it says, on Monday, just as the Tim Hunt, women get in the way of science, things seem to be dying down. London Mayor Boris Johnson stepped in with the helpful clarification via his Telegraph column that Hunt had simply been describing a, quote, natural phenomenon. The reason women are crying this sea of snot and tears into petri dishes, he said, is largely down to their lady bodies. Johnson pointed out to all sorts of biological explanations for the fact that women cry more, and cry more they do, particularly in certain cultures such as ours. According to a world crying expert, I don't even know what that means, Professor Ad Vingerhoots, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, of Tilburg University, who Johnson quoted, women cry 30 to 64 times a year on average compared to 6 to 17 times for men. Men are said to have differently shaped tear ducts, for instance, and can therefore retain the tears for longer before they splash down the cheek. Women are said to have more prolactin, a hormone associated with weeping. I would have thought that all this stuff could be filed as the latest stunning discovery from the University of Bleeding Obvious. Except, as with anything gender-related, it's not obvious at all. Vingerhoots himself is certainly not making any such simplistic claim. He says, quote, I have no doubts that with respect to crying, there are substantial differences between adult men and adult women, he told Vice. However, Vingerhoot cites a range of influences affecting this propensity to sob, including exposure to emotional events, relative feelings of helplessness, and socialization. The latter, of course, is key. I grew up with four brothers and have clear memories of my dad stepping in when I was fighting with them. I couldn't untangle it back then, but hearing my brothers told, quote, stop, you'll upset your sister, put me instantly in the weaker position, and most likely I'd cry. Well, boo-hoo, you say. But the cultural acceptance of women's tears, and for men, the shame associated with crying, has far-reaching effects. There are some gender differences in the frequency with which children cry, but from 12, the differences become marked. In terms of social learning, the reactions of peers are more important than those of the parents, Vingerhoot say. Especially boys aged 12 to 15 are very sensitive to this influence. They don't want to be considered, quote, sissies, end quote. And then again, after a bit, uh, a little bit more about the biological and neurological differences that cause men and women to cry, Differently and for different reasons, they continue on saying, quote, Whatever the underlying reason for the tears that Boris describes as splashing down on women's cheeks, what we should be asking is whether crying is a bad thing. Does crying make you unfit to do a job, or do we just associate crying with weakness because we associate it with women? Last year, Facebook's COO, uh, the infamous Sheryl Sandberg, author of Lean In, told Harvard graduates that crying at work is nothing to be afraid of. She said, quote, I've cried at work, she said. I've told people I've cried at work. It is all professional, and it is all personal, all at the same time. Well, <laughs> what a female thing to say. There is, in fact, a difference between the professional and the personal in the workplace, but whatever, that's a topic for a different video. Uh, and and uh, the article continues, and uh, the gentleman who was speaking originally says, I've been on and off antidepressants since I was 17, and the times I'm off them, I inevitably end up crying at some point. I've cried in pretty much every job I've ever had. Has it affected my ability to work? No. 
One in four adults will experience a mental health problem in the course of the year, with anxiety and depression topping the list. Of course, crying doesn't always indicate a mental health issue, but a culture which resolutely refuses to tolerate emotions of vulnerability is toxic. There's plenty in real life, never mind the size of your tear ducts, to make us cry. The way forward seems to be more, not less, acknowledgement of this. Bring on the male tears, end quote. Now, a couple of things in, in, in response to this. First, I should stress that the key here isn't for men to, quote, ask society to, quote, allow them to cry. The key here is for men to literally go their own way and embrace the full range of human emotion on their own, crying included. We should not ask for permission from anyone, society included, to experience anything. But we should be cognizant of the consequences of unapologetically doing so. You know, Sheryl Sandberg and her ilk have access to a societal, you know, default setting, if you will, that extends to them some form of compassion simply for being women. And coupled with the fact that they're, they are feminists, women such as this have leveraged society for the maximum amount of special treatment and privilege possible. So, you know, uh, as a result of that, a man who cries too much at the workplace can expect immediate ridicule on the first occasion, and if the behavior continues, he'll likely lose his job. And as the article states, starting as early as age 12, boys understand this social penalty for expressing emotion, and they internalize it and carry it with them into adulthood. And in adulthood, they learn to aggressively negotiate for their wages, while, you know, the Sheryl Sandbergs and Ellen Powells of the world Instead, uh, you know, learn to just, you know, ban salary negotiations altogether to give them a leg up or, you know, just to cry at work. And, and they know that they're not going to be called out on it. So lastly, and, you know, th this is on to the most serious issue I'm going to cover here. There's, there's an article titled, uh, quote, these photos of men crying will challenge your gender preconceptions. Right. And this article, I think, is 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 a bit of a triumph for men. As many of you may already know, the Lithuanian government reintroduced conscription in 2015 and is set to conscript approximately 3,000 men against their will from a list of 37,000 eligible men aged 19 to 26. And this is in Lithuania, a country which has not only the highest suicide rate in the world, but a gendered suicide rate, which has men killing themselves almost six times as often as women. And this country is now seeing fit uh, to forcibly make these men fight and possibly die in combat. How do you think that's going to end up? But in response to this, uh, photos have surfaced of uh, Lithuanian men dressed in uniform, shedding tears as protests against their unlawful conscription. And uh, a photographer, I don't I know I'm going to butcher this, Narinja Rekasudi? I don't know. I'm not even going to try. Uh, the photographer behind that project was quoted as saying the following about the images. He said, quote, We wanted to show how dangerous gender expectations are. A man is expected to be rational, emotionless, and aggressive. It is very important that we as a society allow men to express their emotions and not force a stereotypical archaic role onto them. The photos themselves are not the triumph that I'm talking about. The triumph is that men weren't afraid for possibly the first time ever to publicly show themselves weeping in response to what is a camouflaged, socially accepted form of modern day slavery. And the images do seem a bit over the top and a bit contrived, right? But they exist. And the fact that they do exist is a small victory for men everywhere. Now the true victory is gonna come when men no longer cry in response to being forced to fight. But when they refuse to fight altogether, choosing only to fight in self-defense against those that would aggress against them by forcing them to fight in wars they want no part of. And, and so, uh, again, here are the images, uh, right? And this is uh, a fellow by the name of Janus. And he says, quote, a gun in your hands doesn't define your manliness, right? And another, another gentleman, uh, it's manly to be able to choose for yourself. And another, in my opinion, the archaic times when a man was supposed to kill a buffalo and drag it home to his family are long over. I think that the army is not a bad thing in general, but a compulsory one is definitely not a good thing either. And we're going to finish there, gentlemen. Uh, now it's up to you, and you alone, to determine what your masculinity is. Remember that. Society is going to war against you both mentally and physically to prevent you from doing so, and you must not let them. 
That's all that I have to say, gentlemen. Thanks for listening, and more to come.